for the invitation. And it's nice to see a lot of old friends. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about Herdler's nevelina function. Probably very few of you um, heard about that um, because it's not really a usual tool in this field. And um, also how it's related to fluid permeability tensor. So actually I approach this problem from the probability point of view. I, I, so what is the goal? The story goes like, I'm trying to understand, suppose you are given a porous media, how do you tie the microstructure to the permeability? Okay, then I came upon this tool, the analysis, which is called Hergler's nevelina function. So today I'm going to show you how these two are tied together and how this seemingly, you know, like um, theoretical function theory approach can actually help inform the understanding of permeability. And, I, and this is a joint work with my former student. She, he is now in NIH as a postdoc and my colleague, Shang Yu Zhang in University of Delaware. Okay, and this is the archive um, of um, my talk is based on this. Okay, so this is the outline. I'm going to, to, to show you because this is how I approach this problem. I'm going to show you why. I'm looking at this class of problem. So we'll see something very um, application oriented. So it's a porous media. Okay? And I'm going to show you, and I have to define the Hercules nevelina function. A lot of times it has a lot of different names because people study a lot of, about this, um, I think in the forties or fifties. So a lot of names very useful is everywhere. Um, so it's Hercules nevelina pig or R function. And a special class of this function is called still just function. Okay, so this is the one which we are going to use today. And um, I'll introduce what is permeability. Okay, and we will need to see the mathematical definition of that. And then, and today the, the, the work, okay, so th th let me show you the big picture. The big picture is we came to this problem because we want to understand how the microstructure of a porous media, how does that like influence the permeability, okay? And then, so we're going to look at so this permeability is well-defined. So the classic one, I will take Tatar's definition when he used a 1970s result. So he de mathematically defined what the permeability is, okay, based on the cell problem. And then another piece will be the, um, actually the, the work by um, Rob Lipton and um, Evelyn Nanada. So they were studying the permeability when you study, you know, like a fluid full of a lot of stationary little bubbles, right? So suppose, so fluid can still go through the bubbles, right? But so you can define permeability there. So the other piece is this permeability of fluid with stationary bubbles. So you want to understand how do you describe how well the fluid can go through this random arrays of tiny, tiny bubbles. Okay, so this is a two fluid case. And the other piece is Tatar. So in Tatar's case, the porous media is with a lot of solid inclusion and fluid cannot penetrate through. Okay, so that's a two case. So the contribution of the, the work I'm going to show you today is we indeed tie these two cases together and everything is achieved. Okay, so the tool is this integral representation formula. So I'm going to show you. And along the process to generalize it because the Molina function is a complex value function. You really need to know what's going on in the complex plane. So the first thing is I'm going to complexify this um, um, the parameters, you know, if from Rob Taper to complex value, and then then I can start to use what I know about the nonlinear function. And in the end, I'll show you what it is. Okay. So the, this just to show you, you know, this is the material we are talking about. So the lab is a separate solid. So just imagine fully trying to go through. So this each of the grain of sand you can think of actually the inclusion, right? So flow goes through. And the other one is more like um, the, the bone or you look at that sponge. So the, um, the solid part is connected. Okay, so for both cases, mathematically, mathematically, it's easier to deal with this inclusion type, you know, because they don't touch the outer boundary. But um, results have been modified for this connected solid. But today I'm going to restrict my result in this inclusion case, because everything is very nice and clear. Okay, so what is Darcy's law? So how, how do we describe this permeability? So just imagine you have all this inclusion, solid inclusion, and you want to push the fluid through, right? So you have to apply some pressure gradient to make the fluid go through. So that is described by this U here. You can think of it. 
to be the fluid velocity in, in terms of some kind of average because you have very tiny microstructure out there. And this is a pressure gradient. And you can also have some external force, which is the F, but F doesn't depend on the, the inclusion, okay? If the size of inclusion doesn't. And this K is a so-called Darcy tensor. So, or you can call mobility tensor. So this tells you how the applied pressure gradient trigger the movement of the fluid. Okay, so it's a slow movement regime. And this mu is related to the viscosity. Okay, so the important parameter in today's talk will be the viscosity of fluid. It's a linear regime. Okay, so this is what I've been staring at you know, when my student was writing their thesis. So the first question we have to understand, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay, so this is the application side. What about nemolina Herbert's function? What are they? It's very simple. Okay, so that, let's fix uh, the, the, the usual thing. So C plus, so the C plus C minus depends on the, the sign of imaginary part of a complex number. So look at the complex plane. C plus is the upper half, C minus is the lower half, as simple as this. And the definition of Neolina function or Herbert's function is simply a function which is analytic on the upper half plane. Okay, so it maps the upper half to upper half. You can have all singularities you want on the real axis. Okay, but it has to be analytic on the upper half. And upper half to upper half. Um, so this is Nemolina. And what, I, what the theory I need to use today is a special class of this um, Nemolina Herkulus function. So what is this? So by definition, Nemolina Herkulus can have um, singularity everywhere on the real axis, right? So suppose the singularity of this Nemolina function is only restricted to half of the real axis. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it was to half of the real axis. Based on what I write here, I chop up the negative part, right? So all the bad points are just in the negative part. So the positive part is okay. So if this is the case, and if the sign, so you can talk about function value on the positive real axis, if they are all positive there. And if this imaginary part, okay, so you are looking at this, it is less than or equal to zero, then it's plus s, and if the opposite sign, then it's uh, s minus. Okay. So this is the thing I'm going to use. So, okay, so this is the definition of the function. So you can say, okay, so what? Why should I care? What well, the thing is, this is the beauty of this class of thing. Okay, let me explain to you why. If I know it's a Nemolina function, M, right? Then there will exist a possible row measure. That's called the mu such that for every z on the upper half plane, the function can be represented in this way. C, D are constant, and this new is fixed. Okay, so as you can see, there are two terms here. Okay, so for the general Nevolina function. However, if it's a, if it's a um, still just function, then this, this thing will simplify to this. As you can see, the point is, the point is the integrand here, it's much easier in terms of when you try to match the terms, okay? So this, if it's a class S, then it looks like this. If it's class S minus one, the difference is here. And this, this mean plus zero means you'll stay from zero. So because this term here already absorbed the possible um, support of this measure, okay? So this is the integral representation part. And later we'll see, so, so I can give you some heads up, like if there's anything message to take away from this will be uh, in the study of compos composite material, okay? This MZ usually is a effective property of your composite material. Z usually is a contrast between the two materials you use to make this composite material, okay? So in the, in the, in the study of composite material, usually this is the effective property of different contrast. So this tells you, if you have things like this, it tells you that since the contrast is in this integral, so all the microstructure dependence of your effective property get shoveled into this positive for all measure. So this is thought to be a characterization of how microstructure of a composite material influences the effective property. Okay, so everything's here. So this is a foundation of a lot of um, inverse problems for composite material, okay?
Okay, so the first thing is what is permeability? Okay, let's look, look at Tatar's result, 1970. So this epsilon here is trying to imagine, you can think of this to be the size of inclusion. So in the end, the inclusion is going to shrink to zero. It's going to be smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So just imagine you are given a domain omega and you punch out uh, inclusion size epsilon, right? You do this. And then you look at and you compute this problem. You compute this. And this is a well posed problem. And in, okay, so it's incompressible. Yeah. So for each epsilon, there is a solution. So what Tata proves is after, of course, then you have to extend the pressure and also the, the solution U because you have no information in the inclusion, right? After extension, this is the usual thing people doing homogenization. I believe many of you are familiar with. So you do this then this properly extended function will converge in this way. So this way, after you extend it, divided by epsilon square, it will converge weakly in L2, okay? And the result, this, this um, weak limit will again be divergence free and the boundary condition will become this. You can show this uh, easily and not easy now because we know how he showed it, but okay, at that time, it's not easy. And the pressure will go this way. So the pressure can differ by a constant, the usual way. Okay. So then Tata further show, okay, so the commodernization goes like this. So your solution when epsilon goes to zero will converge to this limit capital U and this limit P. They are related by Darcy's law. I call K tilde because I want to reserve K for something else. Because in Tata's work, for simplicity, he keep this to be one. Okay. So Tatar's word tells you, okay, they are related by this. As you can see, this is exactly Darcy's law. But Tatar provide a, a rigorous way to tell you, to tell all of us what this permeability is. So his result shows that how do you compute this K? So he said, okay, to compute this K, you solve this usual cell problem. So you, now you solve a problem in the periodic cell. Huh? So this Q2 is an inclusion. He said, okay, you solve this problem. So this EI is the unit vector in the i's direction, okay? So suppose, as you can see, the, the permeability is a matrix. If you want to compute the first column of this matrix, what do you do? You solve this problem by using E1 as your right-hand side. Solve this periodic boundary condition such that, so you see it's what is a gamma. So this Q2 is the inclusion, right? So gamma, is it the, the, how do you call it, boundary of that? Okay, you solve this problem. So you have the U sub D. Okay, then you take this U sub D. And then, okay, so you take this U sub D. This I here means the right hand side is the I's direction unit vector. Yes, so you solve this and you dot with the J's direction um, unit vector. This gives your IJ component of the permeability. Okay, so the permeability comes from. You go to the, 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 the periodic cell and you solve this problem, yeah? So the first question come to us will be, okay, so, you know, I, I want to see how microstructure depends on this. What is the difficulty? The difficulty here is I have no information in the inclusion. Okay? I, there's no contrast here. I don't know what, how to call contrast because there's nothing. I cannot talk about discussing the contrast because it's a solid, right? So suppose now I want to, Think about contrast. I have to embed this in something where I can talk about contrast. So that's how, um, that's what led us to the other paper. Okay, so again, so what is another thing which is needed? When you look at this definition, this is not that easy to use because I need something. It will be more convenient if I can see certain kind of energy, some quadratic form, okay? But then you can see that if you, if you, do, into, if you do this kind of uh, thing, okay? So I start from Tatar's definition. I mean, this is a usual trick, right? So you, you say, okay, what is this? This is the UI dot EJ. And EJ, I know, is satisfy a PDE. And then you do integration by part. So all the, the, the thing you don't have to look at. I, I'm just trying to say that in this form, it's not very convenient to manipulate. So you do integration by part and use a fact that for incompressible fluid, Indeed, you do this, this is a transpose. It's a usual symmetric gradient times two, right? So do this, you get this Laplace. And so you do this manipulation, then 
you can see that <clears throat> the permeability we see, which is defined to be the average of velocity in a certain component, indeed has this kind of energy kind of structure. This is a quadratic form. So this E is a usual symmetric part of a vector, okay, the strength. So you can think of, so now the K can be thought of to be the energy dissipation. And when you see this, you know, this is the energy dissipation, which is this term. And of course, the dissipation depends on viscosity. So this is the mu here. Okay, so this one will also be important. Okay, and now we can move on to this two-phase Stokes flow problem. Okay, so what is the difficulty when we try to do this um, versus other type of uh, <clears throat> other thing I have done for um, composite material? It, it, it is tough in the sense that if I want to take this cell problem, I have to respect this periodic boundary condition, right? You respect this periodic boundary condition, you do integration by part. What happened is there will be some um, compatibility problem which will come. So that means usually we are used to this interface have continuity of what? We are used to the continuity of velocity, continuity of normal traction, right? That's what we like. But if I want to do for this purpose, I cannot do that. Because if I do integration by part, then everything will back. I will not be able to have non-zero F here. Okay, that, that's a reason. So, so because of this, we, we come to Lipton's and Alaniana's paper. They, 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 okay, so what is that? So they consider two fluid. One fluid has, okay, fluid one has viscosity mu one. Fluid two has viscosity mu two. So this is just a piecewise constant function, which depends on which point you are in this mixture of fluid. And then this is the usual thing, usual thing very similar to what we saw before. Okay, so this is inclusion, okay, so on and so forth. The difference between this and the previous one is in, in the inclusion, it has its own viscosity. So both sides, I have, I have information. Okay, you saw this two, two full problem. Again, divergence free. Okay, so you want U to be continuous. So on the interface, the velocity is continuous. However, the traction is allowed to jump. So when you see this um, double bracket, I mean jump. Okay, so say outside minus inside. Okay. And then, and this, this condition is very important, no penetration, so no fluid can penetrate from one fluid to the other. This is important for mathematically speaking. So you can, it allows jump in traction. So this tells you the only jump in traction, the direction, only the normal direction, traction can have jump. Okay, in other words, the shear traction has to be continuous. You have to allow this kind of jump, otherwise the problem will not be real case. Okay, so then, so, okay, so I'm just, just to have to be ready to save some writing. So this traction, this, I call this part pi, which is a uh, stress cancer, okay. So this is a problem, okay. So in, in, um, in the work by Lipton and Melinda, so what they want to do is, um, I believe the bubble is this mu too. So the reason they studied this problem at that time was when, when you talk about bubbles, the viscosity will become very, very small, almost zero, okay? So in the end, after we stu they study the problem for, for arbitrary mu one, mu two, and in the end, they want to know when mu two go to zero, what happened, right? So this is their problem for each epsilon. Again, epsilon, you can think of that to be the size of the bubble, okay? So you solve this problem. So Lex Milgram tells you, for every epsilon, um, there is a unique solution. And then they define this something. Okay, so then the convergence is very similar to what Tata has, right? So you still have to scale by epsilon squared. Then you will convert weakly in L2 to a function. And then, so this is the, um, you can think of this to be um, average velocity, scale average velocity and pressure like this. And then, this limit u0 and p will satisfy this. This very similar to Darcy's law, but now the difference is there is something in the inclusion too, okay? So their definition of k is similar, okay, is similar. And then if you write it, you can also write in energy form. So their conclusion is in the end, there will be a permeability popping up here. And this k comes from the solution of this one. Okay, 
Okay, so this is other basic, basic thing. These are the building blocks. Okay, so what do we do? So what we do is, okay, we define a function space because we will write everything in this um, string form. So I have to, and I need um, coins inequality. So I really have to get rid of, I have to make sure this kind of rigid body motion doesn't stay in my space. That's all the, the, re, the only reason why, okay? So this H, Q1, remember Q2 is this, um, so you are looking at this um, periodic cell, Q2 is the inclusion, Q1 is the outside. Okay, so Q1, Q2, you can think of Q2 to be the bubble-like thing, and Q1 is the outer fluid. And then, because I need to do some extension, that's why I define the space like this. But there's really nothing, nothing um, unusual. So the, the, like what I said, so this problem, what I write here is the problem we studied. So the only difference between this and the previous one is here. So I fixed mu one. So the outer, the so chi two is the inclusion. Okay. So the hosting fluid has viscosity mu one, and the inside the inclusion had viscosity z is a complex number times mu one. Okay. So. So, and the new one, the new one is going to be going to be a fixed number. And then I, okay, so I consider this. So just imagine, so now, because I can change it to Z now. So now my permeability will depend on Z, right? I mean, because this is a Z here, depending on what Z I put here, I'll have different solution of the cell problem. So my permeability will depend on the Z. So the first thing you need to see is, okay, so for what kind of Z can you solve this? Well, the answer is Max Milgram, easily leads to the conclusion that for almost for every Z, okay, except the Z on the negative, on the negative real axis. So you look at the complex plane, chop of the negative real axis, then for all other Z, there is a solution. So for those solution, I can define the permeability like the two fluid case in this way. So you can think of this to be the total, total um, energy dissipation. Right, both in the inclusion fluid and the host fluid, but I had to be very careful with all the bar. The bar here is a complex conjugate. Okay, yes, yeah. So now, so what is the thing? I know I only have six minutes. So okay, so what is the story? You see, now now the difficulty comes. You see, I I'm actually I'm doing this because I want to understand. In Tatar's case, the inclusion is solid, right? And in the bu bubble fluid case mu two, the inclusion viscosity is almost zero, correct? Yes, but both infinity and zero is part of where I, where Lex Milgram cannot tell you, right? Lex Milgram tells you what well, zero is not, I cannot tell you whether there's a solution and go to it minus infinity, Lex Milgram doesn't say anything either, but that's what I want, right? So then the first thing you, you have to deal with is see, okay, so what happened when Z is very small? like close to zero, right? What happened when Z is very large? Then I can go to Tatar's case. So you kind of have to go beyond what the direction you can tell you and try to see what you can do there. So this, okay, so because of this, you had to, okay, so what we do is we construct a solution. We construct a solution near Z equals zero and Z equals infinity, okay? And we prove that the K function as a function of Z, when Z go to zero, when, when for a small ball near Z equals zero, actually the function can be analytic extended. And the same case happen when Z go to infinity, okay? So we construct these two solutions, but to, able, for able to, do, to, to be able to do it, you really have to define a proper norm to make your life easier. So this, is, this slide just to tell you we define a norm, okay? So, the norm is here. That this is norm. So the norm is defined to be the energy norm, right? This looks very familiar to this permeability here. Yes. So this is a norm. So we define this norm. That's why I have to, I have to kick out all the rigid body motion to make sure this is a norm. So once you, you show this, so we get to show this. You say, okay, so this norm is equivalent to H1 norm because actually because the, the, the velocity is continuous on the interface, so it's fine. So he's just to show you. So where, what does the constant depends on? Well, the constant depends on the coins inequality of your microstructure, okay? So it's the first hint, the first microstructure information comes in. 
Okay, so now that then um, what else? Yeah, so I say this already. Right, everything's fine except the z on the negative real axis, and you have this kind of symmetry. Okay, so this is what Lex Milgram can tell you. What Lex Milgram cannot tell you, you have to do this kind of work. Okay, so you say, okay, you, you put this on so you say, well, okay, so near z equals infinity is near w equals zero. You have to do this inside outside iteration, okay, which is tedious. I'm not going to, I don't have time to do that to show it here. But you do this and you do prove things, okay? So in the end, what happened is not only we prove near, when z is very large, when it's you know, like in the neighborhood of infinity, everything's fine. We construct a solution. I'm going, not going to bore you with the detail. Okay, so we, I chop off the singularity near z equals infinity by doing this, all right? And also we prove that when z goes to infinity, so we say, okay, when z, is close enough to infinity, what does that mean? So this comes another constant E1 square. The E1 is a constant, so what is this? So this is when you try to do this inside outside iteration, you need to extend. Suppose I want to go from inside to outside. I want to is extend this divergence tree function outside this inclusion just a little bit, okay? So this comes from the theory about um, H H1 extension of divergence tree function, okay? So this depends on the shape of this inclusion. Okay, so this is the E1. So this E1 constant tells you how, how close you have to be you know, to this infinity. Okay, so this is another geometry constant here. And we show you that in here, if I let in this ball, in this disk, then everything's fine. The inside goes to zero, nothing is inside. So it's like Tata's case. And when you go very close to infinity, indeed, you recover Tata's cell problem, okay? And the convergent goes that one over Z. And you can do the same thing for small Z, okay? So this is trickier because P has to play an important role, okay? But still, you can go through this. And then, so what is the conclusion? The conclusion is for small Z, if Z close enough to zero, so this E2 is when you extend from outside to inside, Okay, a divergence free function. This comes from the geometry constant. It tells you again, so the convergence is this one. Okay, so, so because of this, so Lex Milgram tells you that you have to chop off this negative um, real axis, right? But after you prove that close to zero, you are fine, close to infinity, you are fine. So then now the singularity is in this finite thing. Okay, this finite thing given by this constant, which are extension constant. Okay. So to convince, so um, Shang Shang Yu said, okay, so he saw my results, I said, can you compute it for me? I really, you know, I want to see what it is. So he, so we, here is the numerical result. Okay, I didn't tell you what he is. Okay, let me show you. This is another important result. Um, so you be, hold on. Mm -hmm. Here I So essentially what is B? So, okay, I'm, I don't have that here. The KB is, remember I have the inside and outside problem, right? So when you take it, you have to take the dissipation in the outside, dissipation in the inside. You solve two problems, you get this KB in the limit case. So here, the inclusion supposes a square, it's Q2, it's a 2D case. Mu1 is one, the hosting fluid has viscosity one. And then when it's very large, that means you go to Tata's case. So this is this is, means different level of finite element simulation. Okay, so you see the convergence in terms of numbers. So I'll conclude my my result in this. So what about the Neville Van Lima function? So because of all of this, because of the symmetry, I can prove because this is the definition of the permeability. These two properties I can show very easily by using the usual trait. Okay, so. After these two are satisfied, then I know it looks like this, okay? But because I know this function has no singularity outside certain interval, so I can further chop off this to do this, okay? And so what about ellipticity? Okay, so usually for this, this spectrum also comes from a self-adjoint operator. You can show, it's very tedious, but you can show. This is the operator and then you can put these two sides together, then this will tell you the moments of this integral representation actually are related to microstructure in this way. So this is the end of my talk.
Thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, uh, because we are slightly uh, above time, we won't be we won't be taking questions until the end. So let's move with a, a case. Okay, I'll start sharing. With a Casey Rodriguez, but thank you one for the for the nice talk and the and the interesting talk. And so. by the way, I think it, the the chat should have been habilitated now. So if you have personal questions, you should be able yeah, to. Actually, chat now. I, I was going to to mention that. So the, at least for me, chat is completely disabled. I even cannot write to you, Sylvia, to any of the hosts. Oh, Mariela. Okay. So just saying, you know, maybe if you want to ask questions to uh, to Yvonne by chat, that would be uh, useful. Yeah. So Mariela, uh, okay. can you start the, is the okay is the, now? Now, now we can only I can only send messages to everybody or to hosts. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe okay. now. Yeah. I think I. No. no. He only has everyone or the host. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have the specific person. Ah, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. So if Casey maybe can start sharing, and then we'll try to figure out. We'll try to send them a message once it is habilitated, and then at that time you can hopefully chat among yourselves. Sorry. Okay. Can y'all see that? All right. Yes, we can see it. Uh, good to see you. Uh, 